And we're going to talk about a subject that I'm really passionate about that's maybe the most important topic we can talk about today. The mission that we all need to really take on, and that's our soil. I just came out of a meeting about an hour and a half ago with Whole Foods here in Austin. Their headquarters are here. And their first question they asked was, what are you doing about regenerative agriculture? Now, that was a really interesting segue to go from that to this. Well, my name's Larry Jacobs. Uh, I farm on the West Coast. We grow cherry tomatoes and culinary herbs. Been doing it for about 35 years. Farming organically, we supply fresh, uh, fresh vegetables across the United States. And this regenerative ag topic is coming up a lot today. And uh, I think it's an important topic, and I think it's uh, something we really need to be thinking about. So we've got three really interesting individuals here. Uh, Jimmy Emmons. Jimmy's uh, a third generation farmer from Western Oklahoma. He's been doing this a long time. He started farming, took over the, the family farm in 1980, if I got that right. Uh, he's um, been very innovative. Uh-oh, I got my troublemaker here in the back. <laughs> He's been very innovative in looking for ways of improving the way he's farming, and I'll let him talk to it. But he's well recognized in the area. He's been working with a lot of young people. He's uh, headed up a lot of different organizations in his area. Uh, and he has a wealth of knowledge and experience. And I think the biggest thing is he's actually doing it. Uh, Justin is... Uh, Justin's passionate about compost, can I say? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but he, he came to this, you know, he had 15 years. Uh, was you in Iraq for 15 years? or it's 15, months. 15 months? 15 months, yeah, 15 months. Came back after 15 months, and he's got, got a lot of awards. And figured out that this was the thing to do. His, his mission today is making compost. And then David, uh, originally from Kansas, uh, he's uh, got a PhD. I didn't ask what your doctorate work was in. Special Education and Rehabilitation. And he's connected with a really interesting company that's developed a proprietary bacterial mix for improving the soil. So we're going to do this, so we're gonna leave, I'm going to make this a little open, I'm going to expose these guys to your, your questions, so if you have a question, raise your hand, I'll stop them, mid-sentence, and we can dive right in. We're going to start with Justin to get some of an overview on the composting side, what that does. Go to David, and he can, so gear is a sort of a laser in on some of the specifics and you know, how you can do this a little bit better, and then finish off with, with Jimmy to hear you know, how it's working on a 2,000-acre farm. And what I'm hoping that you guys get out, get out of this today is, if just one thing, what's the one big thing you can do to make your soil better and make your businesses and your farms more profitable? So with that, Justin, you're on. I'll give you a mic. You can use it or not. Right, there we go. Still have the command voice, but all right. It's fine. Tone it down. All right. I feel like a wedding DJ. Can everybody hear me? All right, cool. So my name's Justin. Um, I think, let me start my little timer here so I don't suck up every other panelist's time. I always hate when people do that to me. I'm, I'm oh, you're also timekeeping? All right, so there's secondary control measures here. All right, good. All right, so... Um, I won't go too deep into the whole, my whole story with my business and stuff. There's a panel on that tomorrow if you want to hear my sad story. Or we can talk about it at the bar later, you know, if we get a couple of drinks into us. But uh, long story short, my name's Justin. I own a company called Veteran Compost. So I did 10 years in the Army, got home from that. And like a lot of folks uh, who may have ended up in farming, I couldn't find a job. So nothing breeds innovation like desperation. So I started to look around and I discovered composting. And so what our company does, uh, we started as me, 
uh, nine years ago, and now we have 25 full-time employees. Um, and we collect and compost food scraps from homes and offices and businesses, and we compost them at farm-based uh, locations. We have one in Aberdeen, Maryland. I never served at the Proving Ground, but I now live three miles from it. Uh, we have one in Fairfax, Virginia, and we're building another one near Annapolis. Um, and so we take all that food waste that we collect from folks, whether it's five gallons on someone's doorstep or a tractor trailer or a Red Bull, and we take all the material and we compost it. And so. I, uh, growing up, I didn't come from like an agricultural farm, farm family. I didn't come from a family in the waste business. This was all discovered. Um, but I do appreciate sustainability. Now, full disclosure, I drive an F-150 and I eat steak. So like, you know, I'm not fully committed to sustainability. <laughs> but like, I, an Impossible Burger is cool, but you're not going to trick me. So um, anyway, so but composting kind of makes sense because there's a lot of need there's a need to have something more sustainable like i tell a lot of groups is i think about the things that people did 100 years ago that we look at now and we're like what were they thinking that's silly and i think it's gonna be really hard to tell my grandkids someday that we thought it was a good idea that when we were done with something we put it in a truck and we drive to the top of a hill and dump it in a hole and bury it and then we put grass on top and call it a soccer field when we're done and just drive away and that's what we're doing with landfills it doesn't make any sense you know there's a need to do something better with our waste and there's a need to fix our soil I mean I'm preaching to the choir if you came to this session about the value of soil but there's a need for our compost I have never ever had to advertise to sell my compost there's people that are out there that want it and we move the stuff every year so if you make compost whether you're gonna use it at your own farm or you're looking to market it there will always be a need for it because the soil needs more of what you got so what I want to do is just take a couple minutes to just cover the high points of compost I'm hanging out all day, so if you have specific questions that we don't get to about composting or things you're trying to do at your property, I'm happy to talk for you as long as, as you want to answer any questions you have, or if I don't know the answer, I can find out for you. Um, but generally, the basics of compost is, why do you, why do you need this stuff? There's a lot, of different, a lot of different needs. There's nutrients and micronutrients. I mean, there's a lot of things in compost, not just the NPK, but all the other things like calcium and other small trace minerals that you might not think of. Um, but what we really sell the product on to our customers is it's a live product. So compost is a living thing that when you put in your soil, brings your soil back to life. So just like there's the circle of life here above, you know, where f whales eat fish and tigers eat whales or however it works with the food chain here above ground there's also that going on below our feet where there's a whole soil food web and if you want to go down a rabbit hole on the internet one night look up Dr. Ingham and the soil food web and there you go you'll start checking all this cool stuff about nematodes and protozoa and I'm sure all the stuff that we're going to get to next um, but it's that live action of compost that makes it great it's great at holding water in sandy soil it breaks up clay soil um, it helps prevent disease it's a great product and so um, just something to think about if you're thinking about composting at your farm there's a couple of different methods and it may seem daunting yeah you may want to just do something simple like a three bin system or you may be looking for something bigger um, you can look up windrow composting there are tractor pulled systems that are out there um, I when I was getting started thought that's what I was gonna do but when I did kind of crunch the numbers um, you have to have a tractor with a creeper gear you have to buy the attachment it takes up a lot of diesel and labor to do that so and all the windrows take up a lot of space so I kind of went away from windrow composting and my composting method it's called ASP aerated static pile composting so if you look up aerated static pile composting online you'll see it's like eighth grade science project is what I tell people. All we're doing is providing oxygen to the microbes. So we mix together high nitrogen materials, greens, with high brown material, high carbon material. So we, at our facility, typically use wood chips from tree companies and food scraps. And we mix those together and put them in a large pile. And every 10 feet is a perforated pipe. Now there are systems out there that Gore-Tex and ECS and German companies make that are millions of dollars. The municipality near us spent six million dollars on an ASP system at their landfill. At our farm in Maryland, we compost more stuff per day and I buy all the parts on Amazon and Home Depot. So it's out there and you can do it. And if you have questions about that, we can talk more about that later. But that method is the set it and forget it Ronco rotisserie method. If you ever watch nighttime TV, 
you build the pile and then you walk away. And if you're farming, that's a great thing. Anything you can walk away from and does its own thing, that's an awesome thing to have. So we build the pile after we mix it. For 30 days, there's blowers hooked up to those pipes I mentioned, and they're on timers. And the timers just come on and off. We spend less than $50 a month to do a couple thousand yards of composting a month. So if you're doing a smaller pile on your farm, maybe the cost of a light bulb or two. So you probably wouldn't notice it. But what happens is over 30 days, you go from compostable waste to a compost that's broken down. And if you're interested in NOP guidelines or meeting certain things for vegetable production, that pile is going to get really hot. Within two days, we're at 131 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. We don't like to go above 160 because microbes don't live above 160 in your turkey in the oven or in the compost pile. So. After 30 days, our compost has gone through the active composting phase. We screen it, and then we let it cure like a fine box of wine. And all together, it's 90 days from the minute a hot dog or hamburger comes into our farm to when it's finished compost that we're ready to use on the field or we're ready to market to someone. So if that's something you're thinking about, we can talk more about the specifics. But if you look up ASP, and I'll give a couple of name drops here of things to look at that... Um, our potential resources for that method. I'm a big proponent of that method. We also do worm composting, so if people have questions about that, um, that's been really good for us. Um, it, in Years ago when we sold stuff to people and we said, what do you grow? And just making small talk with customers, like I'm sure you do at the farmer's market, they'd tell me about their garden. But there's always a certain percentage of customers that when you ask them what they're growing, they would be like, tomatoes? And there's always a question mark at the end. That was always like suspicious, right? Why are they being weird about it? And it turns out that all those people who paid in cash and kind of drove like, you know, hippy dippy cars, it turns out they're growing pot. So uh, I, drink, I drink beer. It's not really my scene, but that is a huge buyer of our worm castings. So if you're thinking about another value added product for your farm operation, either to use or to sell, um, turns out people who grow marijuana are very well educated and they like to spend money on good additives, and so they buy out all of our worm castings month after month, so God bless them. Um, and then finally, when you're thinking about composting at the farm, there's a lot of competing interests at the farm. So what I always tell people is you got to think about the cost benefit analysis. It may seem very appetizing to jump into composting. You're going to drive around, pick stuff up. You're going to compost it. You're going to use it or market it. You just have to th be reasonable in your expectations of how many hours are in a day and how much space and resources are available for this operation at your farm. So just think about how this fits in. And I think that helps to drive things, whether you should just be buying the compost or whether you should be making it. I mean, for the method I use, we use primarily skid loaders. That's something that was already at the farm. And so we use electricity. That was already at the farm. So it may bolt into what you do, or it may be something where you say, I just need to buy it off of somebody and budget for that. And then finally, I just want to name drop a couple of resources in this last minute that I have. If you look up a company called O2 Compost, so if you're interested in ASP composting, it's run by a guy, Peter, who's a friend of mine. He does a lot of manure composting, and that's how he made his bread and butter. I'm not advocating you sign up for his service or his or whatever, but if you just go on the website, he has a, he has a gallery of hundreds of projects, and you can just get an idea of maybe something you could do at your farm. So if nothing else, it's a, a cool resource. O2 as in oxygen, yeah, because we're, we're doing aerobic composting. So if you look up O2 compost, like I said, not, not a sales pitch for Peter, but his website's kind of cool because you can see the idea and the concept, and people have done it a million different ways on their farms to fit it in with the layout or the terrain or their equipment and stuff like that. So it's kind of cool. The next one is the on-farm compost handbook. If you go on and Google the on-farm compost handbook, there's a PDF. It's free. I don't like to read things on the computer. I would not do well in public school now because I don't like to read stuff on the computer. I like to have a paper copy. So you can also find paper copies of the on-farm compost handbook uh, on Amazon or on the, the PALS website. That book is like an army FM is what it reminds me of because it's everything. Everything in the army was always built to like an eighth grade education. Like I, I was a combat engineer and I know how to blow up bridges, but that's only because like plug and chug arithmetic and then, you know, okay, here's how much C4 we slap on that puppy. So same thing here is it walks you through step by step with eighth grade language, geometry, and algebra of all the different concepts that I kind of briefly touched about, about layout, feedstock considerations, process time, machine time, and it helps you with not only laying it out, but kind of crunching the numbers with some basic farm math of is this something I should do and what should I budget? So the on-farm compost handbook, awesome book. It's what we use um, day to day at the farm. Um, there's my timer. Two things I'll just plug real quick. NC State, if you're looking to do worm composting, NC State, there's an extension officer. 
Rhonda Sherman, that's my lady. Look up Rhonda at NC State. Ton of free information. She hosts a worm conference. You want to go to a weird conference, go to the worm compost conference. And then finally, Cornell. Cornell has a great free resources on the Cornell website about composting. You know, great research university. So if you check out Cornell, another website with tons of free information about, uh, about composting resources. So, and that, I'll step back. Okay. David, yes. you want to dig into more of the, the science? Yeah, can you be my arrow guy and advance slides? Be honored to, sir. You hold on to this massive beast. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. Uh, my name is David Cohn. Uh, as he introduced me, I was a Marine helicopter pilot for a good part of the last century, and then in this century, I was an Air Force Reserve combat rescue pilot, and then. Um, Recently, we had some mathematical issues with ARPC with counting up reserve points for reserve retirement and active duty points for active duty retirement. And if we're all reservists or we're all active duty, well, I'm a both. <laughs> and their math didn't add up. I have 21 years, four months. Uh, every month was a good month because I had a lot of active duty time. The reserve side was like, well, no, you didn't have any reserve points here because you're on active duty. Yeah, those points count. Anyway, I just took my oath last uh, November 1st, so I am serving again in the Arizona Air National Guard pumping gas for jets for four years to make sure I get my, <laughs> to get my, my points in my pension. So we do what we have to do, right? Uh, I ended up with this in, involved with this product uh, through a... a no particular design of my own. What I found out was, as I got into this particular field, this is something that we, as a, as a planet, we need. <laughs> not, not as a locality, not as a state, not as a country, as a planet. We need to be able to fix our soil so we can feed us. We got a lot more people that are coming behind us. And so to start out with, I'll just give you a quick rundown on, on soils. Basically, 5% of this is organic matter if you have good soil. Can you hit the advance button? Perfect. And this basically tells you uh, in, a, in a small concept how soils are and what they are, all right? And if you have any questions, if it's going too fast, slow me down. Next slide. Um, so what we're trying to do is when we have healthy soil, this is all taking place over hundreds or th thousands, if not millenniums, to create the soils that used to be here for the majority of the planet. We as, as, a, as a planet have kind of industrialized agriculture to the point where we use this stuff that they found in uh, World War II called anhydrous ammonia. The idea was, was if we put this into the ground, it made the ground really, really hard. We could land airplanes on it. We could walk away across the Pacific Ocean and invade Japan. Some of the guys realized that that also made plants grow. So it was also very inexpensive. So for about 40 years after World War II, we were injecting anhydrous ammonia into our soils. Anhydrous ammonia basically killed all the bacteria that was in the soil and made the soils very hard, very difficult to work with, we have a lot of our farmers that have been using my product for years are using the little Kubotas, old 15-year Kubotas that our, our wonderful sponsor sells, as well as 1970s era 88 horsepower tractors. Their neighbors are using 6,500, 750 tracked vehicles to plow their ground because their ground is so hard and so mismanaged. So the way we improve this organic matter to make our soils more workable is we use crop residue, biological stimulants, that's us. These are other ways you can do that to improve our basic biological content in our soil. Next one, please. While we were trying to do this, most of us in here know that if we can improve our organic quality of our soil that uh, we're going to have a more productive soil, a more productive farm. How do we do that? Well. Uh, we asked farmers what they wanted to see, what would be the best way to incorporate something into their normal farm operations. They wanted a product that was easy to use, they could put a lot on per acre, actual put on live microorganisms, quicker response time, and more cost effective. Next one, please. 
So we came up with, I didn't, but a gentleman in Utah came up with the Back to Feed Soil Treatment and the Back to Feed OST. These are basically Safeway cake mix and Betty Crocker cake mix. These are all the basics, everything that you need to have in your, in your, uh, uh, in, in the, our solution here. So the, the, the bacillus, the protozoa, the fungals, the stimulants, the food package that's in there, this is all the same. When we go through this OST, we are going through a company called Omri. Anybody familiar with Omri? What this does is this kind of cuts out the middleman of the, of the uh, agency that's the organic certifying company. And rather than have to go through an agency with the Omri, you, you basically are instantly uh, certified to be on your crops. No questions. The problem with it is, is Omri knows that. So whether I buy protozoa or bacillus from here or bacillus from there, these guys turn this into Betty Crocker cake mix, and so I pay more for my bacillus and for my stimulants and for my enzymes. So this is a little bit more pricey, same result, and if you go through like CCOF or any other certifying agencies, they will be more than happy to run us through. Uh, they're very familiar with us, and they'll give you your certificate to grow, use us for food production. Next slide, please. Um, when we, uh, and go to the next one. Basically, how does it work? What it is, is it's a powder, and I meant to bring my powder in here with me. If you find me at the, at the table uh, in the other room, you'll see me there with my powder. It basically is a dry powder because it turns out most farmers have access to water. So I don't need to ship you a wet biological that you put on at a, a thimble per acre. What we do is we sell you the dry product, you put it in a tank, you mix it up, and then you run it out and you run it out as heavy as you want, but we, our basic starting rate is about 20 gallons per acre. Not a pint, not a quart, not one gallon, 20 gallons per acre. So we are putting trillions of live microorganisms into your soil in a hurry. Next slide. Uh, the difference is, is this particular, I don't know if you can see the, the earthworm there, but uh, and a better picture, try one more, see if the, we get the picture of my worm. Nah, we didn't get it. Anyway, the, uh, the difference is that, that prior picture was a shovel full of our dirt. Uh, and the reason why it's in, uh, relevant is the gentleman who we, was, we were out there with was an agronomist who's been in Yuma, Arizona for over 30 years. He's never seen an earthworm in an alfalfa field because the soils are so compacted, there's so much sodium in the soil out there, uh, and it's so hot, and it's just such a challenging environment, he hasn't seen an earthworm. After six weeks of using our product, which was two applications, they had earthworms. And that kind of freaked him out, but basically what that is an indication for me and you is, we are regenerating that soil, because that soil is its own earth system, ecosystem. This is what the control field looked like for a soil probe, after two applications. This is after two applications of back to feed. So what that means is we not only got greater penetration, but we also got more water to go down, more air to go down, more room for this probe to go down, more room for the roots to grow. Next slide. Uh, these are a couple of, of fields uh, right after the tillage. And you can see this guy had to go through and do a deep rip. This guy didn't need to deep, deep rip to turn his soil over. He went through with a plow. He didn't, this is, this is not even disc yet. This is just plowed. He's got a lot of work to do to get this thing ready to plant any kind of produce. He's gonna have four or five more passes with a tractor. So his cost in fuel, his cost in operation, his cost in labor is gonna be outrageous. This, two or three passes and he's ready to plant. Okay, next. Here's what that's, the same fields look like between the two. These have been watered on the same schedule. They're basically side-by-side -side fields. You take your hand, you, 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 you pop that one, it shatters. You pop this one, this one will go through a truck window before it breaks, and there you can see it below. Next one. And uh, there's my worm. <laughs> so. And then uh, this is, you can't really tell by the striations because it breaks up on this big screen, but this is a, basically a very striated soil pattern. This is almost like, like, a, like a cake mix. Next slide. And then uh, 
the, the idea, again, is if we can get live microorganisms down into the soil to a point where they can make the transpiration of carbon and nitrogen from the atmosphere, water cycles better. Uh, we also are able to decompose, break up bonds between uh, a lot of our nutrients that are locked up, phosphorus, phosphorus, calcium, potassium tend to lock up in the soil. When we put this in there, it basically breaks those things down so that they can separate and be absorbed by the root structure. This is what it looks like when your soil is free and open. Each one of these guys is going to suck up almost, uh, a mathematician figured this out, 70% more nutrition than this guy can simply because of surface area of the root. So that's what happens when you open up the soil. This field ended up producing 10 more bales per acre of alfalfa over the course of a season. That's 120 more bales per acre. That's some pretty good money for eight bucks an acre. Okay, next slide. So essentially, um, that's the, the hardest part for people to understand is that this isn't, isn't anything that is never been tried before. It's nothing new. It's basically we're trying to regenerate the soil biology that was there thousands of years ago, if not hundreds of years ago. This system allows us to do that. We're, we can't make it great like it was, but we can try and get it there as fast as we can by putting what was in there originally back to it. And so a lot, of our, a lot of our microbes that are in our soil packet won't take to that particular piece of ground. So a sandier piece of ground, some of the fungals will take, some won't. A more heavier, heavy clay-based soil, same situation. But the bottom line is, is that we have a large uh, a number of microbials, fungal stimulants, et cetera, that will create acids and other things that will enhance the viability of your soil. Uh, over time and with applications. Uh, our goal is to make it as inexpensive as possible so you use as much as you possibly can and in so doing rapidly improve the quality of your soil, maintain that quality of your soil and grow as much food as inexpensively as possible. I'll give you a couple quick examples. How much am I doing on time? You're over. Sorry. I'm you go. I apologize. Um, I seriously apologize. No need. We're on, in Arizona you basically get about the average farmer does is about seven or eight cuts of alfalfa a year. And you basically get three years out of a stand of alfalfa, so about 24, 30 cuts tops. We're on a fifth year field now, and this guy has been cutting us 11 times a year. So we've got 55 cuts out of one stand of alfalfa. In the last three years, he has not used herbicide or pesticide one time. His water use has dropped, his production has increased. And typically, after your third or fourth year, you rip that field out and you replant or you plant it with something else. He is going to go into a sixth year, which I didn't advocate. I didn't tell him to do it. But he's just like, I am, I am riding this horse as far as it will go. And I can't blame him for doing it. Anyway, that's me. I'm over here. And uh, I'm looking forward to hear Jimmy talk. <laughs> Check in, see if they got questions. Okay. You're, you're on there, Hal. So just uh, before Jimmy jumps in, because I know this is going to, you guys are going to be real excited to hear what he's doing. Any questions for Justin or, or David? Right here. Can you control the quality of the food waste that you get that it doesn't have plastic bags and other things in it? So the, question, the, question was, uh, the question was, how do we control the quality of the food waste? So rule number one for me is if I wouldn't eat there, I'm not going to take your food waste. So I definitely am selective in whose stuff we take. We probably say no to 10 times more people than we say yes to. On the residential side, so we do, we've kind of two businesses, not to go too far down the rabbit hole, but one part of the business is large commercial. We do hospitals, supermarkets. We do the Baltimore Ravens Stadium, stuff like that, large toters and dumpsters. Uh, we either we pick them up or people bring them to us. And then the other half of our business is residential and like office break rooms down in DC. If you're signing up to pay for monthly service as a homeowner, you're probably a true believer, and we're not going to see a lot of trash. The trashiest stuff we collect is schools. And I only do the schools because I'm hopeful that we're just creating a future crop of true believers in soil and composting. And I suffer through the fact that every damn kid in their school lunch has a bag of chips, a Ziploc bag, and that packet of 
carrot niblets that they don't eat that also is in a plastic bag. So our method at the farm for picking out trash is $9 blue gloves from Home Depot and $15 boots from Tractor Supply. We don't have any robots or technology or stuff like that. So I always tell people is when it comes to the farm, I own it for life. It's either going to get turned into compost or we're going to have to figure out a way to pick it out and dispose of it. So if you're going to bring on outside material off the farm, be very selective of what you take. People are dying to get rid of their food waste. So don't pick it up for free and don't take stuff you don't want to take. Wherever you're at, people want to send it to you and they want to pay you for it. So stand your ground when you go to pick out the material that you're going to take because I have made some dumb mistakes and I'm still picking out that trash. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Hold on. Is there a particular type of wood that you use? So, a particular type yeah. of wood that we use. So, we take in arbor chips from tree companies and we do that for free. So, in different parts of the country, you know, the wood product industry is different. So, where we're at, uh, we can take in the tree trucks for free and they'll come to us. And we take anything. We, I don't have a grinder. There was a brief period where I had a tub grinder uh, last year. And then I don't even had a tub grinder or seen one. I had one from Hay Buster or their other brand off a of hay buster it's the scariest thing we've ever owned at the farm and like I just looked at that thing 120 horsepower John Deere motor with hammer spinning at the bottom of the, the tub grinder and I'm like we're done get it out of here I like all my dudes and I want to keep them in Pete in one piece so everything we take in is already chipped in terms of whether it's like pine or oak or anything like that as long as it's chipped it's good for us um, but you know we make sure that all the guys it is chipped because some guys in the tree business they'll try to sneak in those rounds or they'll try to sneak in those branches when you and I are looking so we don't let them leave until we flip over the pile of wood chips with a skid loader real quick and make sure they didn't sneak anything in there but in terms of types of wood chip we we, we take it all yes sir It depends on your crop, uh, and it's, it's just to make sure we're clear, it's not a chemical. These are all biologicals, so it's, uh, nothing's going to corrode or explode. My dog drinks it, and he just sleeps a lot, so it won't hurt you at all. But what you would do is you would brew it up, and for example, a hay farmer, we're going to run every time we cut, which is about 24 to 32 days to keep the feed value up. As soon as that last bale's off the field, we're going to water, and we're going to put it in with the water because it's just cost effective to do so. So it goes on after every cut of alfalfa. With a corn, we try and get four good applications down before the tassel. So in the first 30 to 40 days, four applications. And a lot of that depends on how things are going with, uh, with his operation. Uh, for cotton, about the same thing. We try and get it down early, as soon after seed hits the soil as possible. That way we can do the, have the maximum effect on that germination and on making space for those roots to go find their own food. Uh, yes, sir. So the question is for organic, organic compost, what kind of inputs? I, I, we are not organic. And the funny thing is that what makes us not organic is there is a chain of grocery stores in the D.C., Philadelphia area, and they're, they're expanding very quickly. It's called Mom's Organic Market. And they are, I mean, they have a part of one of the aisles that is uh, insect derived protein so they have cricket powder and all that stuff I mean they are like they're organic organic man um, but they have compostable cups and compostable produce bags because they don't want to have any plastic waste in their store and because we take in compostable cups and straws which I think is more important for society to keep it out of the effing ocean but because we take in those compostable cups were not allowed to be approved as organic. So I, I don't know a lot about the NOP certified compost because I know we're just right off the bat not allowed to be part of it. But there are ways to do it. There, if you get, if you were to make some, I think you'd be, that'd be a good thing either use yourself or market because there is a very limited supply of approved compost vendors for the organic program. But we are not because of those compostable straws and cups. It's very possible, yes. If you go on the Omri website, there's a long list of people that do have the certification, you know, yeah. Okay, we'll do one more, and then we're going to jump to Jimmy, okay. and then we're going to have more of an in-depth conversation. Go ahead. Uh, this is a question for David. Um, because you're in a dry area climate and you are rapidly increasing the water holding capacity of the soil, has there been any kind of push in Arizona to 
incorporate more agroforestry practices where you have perennial intercropping or alley cropping with those annual crops? Sadly, no. David, you want to repeat this? Well, I'll let him say it better because I won't get it right. So go ahead and repeat your question if you would. Because of the increase of water holding capacity within the soil in a dry, arid climate, is there any effort to incorporate agroforestry practices that would include perennial intercropping or alley cropping? I can say that in the Midwest, that's big and it's rolling and it's, and it's moving its way west. But where we have such a short term on a lot of our crops, 30 days for vegetables, you know, Sudan, wheat, corn, um, no, we should. But we don't. So hope, I'm sorry for the answer, but that's the truth. I can make a comment on sure. there. There is a Southwest. Oh, hold, hold, hold on. Let me get it. I'll give you the mic. There is a Southwest Agroforestry Network that's just been established, and uh, the person that's coordinating that is at Northern Arizona University. Okay. So. So, so Jimmy's going to, Jimmy's doing this stuff. He's living it. He breathes it. And Jimmy believes that improving your soil is good for your business. There you go. All right. Well, would you? Yes, so, <clears throat> how many of you know what regenerative ag is? All right. Cool. All right. Well, I won't go in that. So, we're, my wife and I, are standing in our garden that we donate to the regional food bank. That's a garden. We used to call it a chaos garden because we mixed all our cover crop seed with about 30 different vegetables in there. And this three acres uh, would produce anywhere from six to 7,000 pounds of, of vegetables for the local food bank. So it is more important than you know. You know, I'm third generation on our family farm in Oklahoma. My granddad came from my great-granddad came from Texas. So in 1926, my granddad came to Oklahoma and started where we're still at. And uh, through a train of events of tragedies, I lost my granddad and my dad within about a year and a half. And so I got, got pushed into the, the operation a little quicker than I would probably wanted to be, but I really wanted to be. And uh, so regenerative ag, you know, we like the five principles of soil health. We like to have armor on soil all the time. I don't ever want to see mine unless I'm looking at it. I want lots of diversity. I want to integrate animals, and I want lots of diversity. I used to grow wheat, alfalfa, and a little dab of cotton, and our ground looked just like this, bare. We started going to no-till and regenerative ag and I look back before I came down here, in the last seven years, I've reduced my fuel cost from about $121,000 in fuel alone per year, and I'm right at $18,400 uh, for this year. From the same amount of acres, 2,000 acres of production land and about 6,000 acres of range land. So I started down this cover crop thing, and it's very hard to do if you grew up being a clean till farmer because, you know, clean is good. Monocultures, just like the gentleman before me has talked about, really destroyed our soils with chemicals and fertilizers and monocropping. Mother Earth was never designed to grow one crop year after year after year. So I planted this, but then I panicked. I just panicked. I was in year one. I couldn't stand it. I, I decided I couldn't drill into that. And so what did I do? I plowed it up. I disc it under. Man, it looked pretty. I thought it did. I'm sorry for the picture, but you can see the bare strip where we, we tilled. When I, when I cut that wheat, I had the same yield. Yeah, I had the same yield. My wife and I had been on the tractor at least 1,000 hours apiece all summer. And back then, my mom was still with us, so we'd run about 3,000 hours on tractors. And it just like an anvil fell out of the sky and hit me in the head, and I said, you know, what the hell am I doing if I can do this and cut all that cost? And so I started. And we started to look and cover crops versus none. 
It's just what they're saying is it's microbiology. You got to feed it so it'll feed you. And, that, and that's where we missed it years ago. And so if you put all this amendments that they're, they're talking about, very good amendments, you still got to have plants out there for them to feed on. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cycle. It's a living cycle. And so I had a gentleman from North Dakota, Jay Fuhrer at the NRCS come down and he helped me dig this up. This is in the same wheat fur, same row, other than cover crops versus none. Okay. So this is a soybean field. Now, I used to raise two crops, three once in a while. I'm up to 14. Diversity. Diversity. And you heard this morning about how tough it is in ag. It is. But we're trying to harvest more often with different crops, more diversity, feed the soil, feed the bacteria, feed everything, the fungi that's in there. So I took this. This is rolled down rye, and we dr drill these beans green. Now I'm going to take my hand and I'm going to move that back. And here's the surface. Now we just talked about water infiltration. And I tell everybody, Ray Charles can tell you where the water's going to go if it rains on this. <laughs> All right. So now I've got this co cool little tool that I use on my iPhone or my iPad. It's called a, a ProScope. And it'll, it'll magnify things for you. And it's really good. So this is really what my top looks like. So when I started irrigating, uh, it's been 12 years ago, about a half inch per irrigation was all I could get in. And it was running out of the field. I've got a great picture, and I, I didn't bring it today because it's short limited time, but I would have been putting on two inches with a sprinkler system, and it rained two and a half inches, and I went down and shut the pivot off, and there's no water standing. Well, duh, yeah. So I went over across the fence into my neighbor's bean field, no cover crops, see some weeds coming. And if you look right here, you see this little funny thing? I'm going to zoom in on this. That's what his surface looks like. Now, Ray Charles can also tell you where the water's going to go. It's off and downstream with nutrients. And you're not going to feed your biology because they got to have water and air too. You got to have gas flow. And that's how important earthworms and all the bacteria in there and the fungi is to get air and gas flow. So if we magnify that, that is not the moon. It is not. That's that surface. We talk about water quality and quantity. We're doing this to ourselves. We are doing this. These are the same soils and on the soil map. Cover crops, none. Now, when it rains, and you can see all the roots in here, there's beans in that field. But once again, the, the great slide you had a while ago showing the root mass. And then when that root mass deteriorates, what is that? That's water infiltration points. That's what my tillage, my earthworms, just like you talked about, I used to never find earthworms. Uh, we just done a study and measurement. I didn't know you could count earthworms, but there is a way that you can count earthworms. <laughs> I got about a million per acre now, and we're still growing. So that, that's pretty important. Now, in regenerative ag, we talk about capturing sunlight and, and producing food. But the key is you take sunlight into the plant. The plant then feeds the biology. And, and a lot of people talk about uh, exudates in the soil, feeding the bi biology. This is a rare photo. This is an Elbon root with my scope going across an earthworm burrow. And, and I got several slides that got closer in on it. But I started seeing these water drops, I thought. It's not. It's an exudate that you never see because the roots are touching the soil. This is how we're feeding our soil, right there. And that's, that's a rare find because, like I said, normally your roots are in contact with soil and you don't get to see that. And I, the big mistake I made that day was not taking that back to the house and looking under a microscope. And there would literally be millions and millions 
of life forms feeding on that. See, what happened is when we started farming, our, our farm ground was very productive. And then we started, once again, going into just straight agriculture, and the land started playing out. Why did it start playing out? Because we weren't feeding it, we weren't taking care of it, and the biology was dying. And when that happens, you get exactly what you were talking about all ago. We have lots of fungi in our soil. Whoop. Can you back up one? Well, there was supposed to be a cool earthworm photo on there. All right. So, Dr. Buzz Clute, I work a lot with Buzz, and he really says it. We know so much about the overwhelming, the life below ground, but we know so little. And, and we're just, we're learning lots and lots and lots. And we've actually got a, a little tool here called Lumni Loop, and we're looking down in the soil there. You know, we like to have a little fun at our place, and... Uh, you know, it's not rocket science like people think it is, but and we like to have a little fun as we go along. Uh, you know, agriculture got to where it wasn't so much fun to me uh, when we was on the tractors and, and we worked so many hours, and now I get to do things like this and, and work for the Undersecretary of Agriculture a little bit. I love Charles Darwin. It's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent but the ones that's most responsive to change. That, that, you know, you gotta be willing to change and do things like we're all doing to make this work. That's the hard one. You know, I tell a story about when I'm going to a conference, I got a heavy foot and they used to call me Crash and there was a reason they used to call me Crash. And uh, I was driving, I was late to a conference and I was letting her rip and Luckily, my local neighbor was trying to pass me, and we met a highway patrolman, and he got stopped. <laughs> kind of cool, but you know what? I was very comfortable then to keep changing and stepping on the gas because I knew the highway patrol was back there. People will change when you're comfortable. If, you can't, if you're very uncomfortable in, in going into something new, it's challenging. You've got to be comfortable. This is where you can find me. I've got lots of videos out. You can Google up on uh, uh, YouTube, Jimmy Emmons in Oklahoma. Uh, this is what it's really all about. That's my grandson. ABC was actually out uh, doing a shoot on our grazing management uh, there. Um, we do what we do for the next generation. And uh, I always say, long live the soil. And you know why? Because it better. Because there's been lots of civilizations that aren't here on the face of this earth because of that. And so that's what I do. And I try to walk the walk and talk the talk. And everything that these gentlemen said today is actually very, very true. The challenge where I live is the availability of raw stuff to make compost. It is 60 miles to Walmart in a town of less than 300, so food waste is, 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 is limited. But just be creative, and, and you got to feed the soil. you got to have something growing on it, and how, I'm done. Okay. So I see we, everyone's raising their hand. i got one question for, I'm going to exercise my rights as the, moderator here and ask Jimmy one question. Jimmy, tell us a little bit about your cattle operation and how you're handling the, the pasture management. So I get the question often about how many cows per acre do you run in western Oklahoma. I used to would have told you 20 head per acre. Now we do intensive grazing management where we use a lot of poly wire and we'll move them cattle anywhere from daily up to four or five days. Uh, yesterday morning, uh, that's what I done was set up electric fence so the wife can move cattle while I'm gone over the next four or five days here. And so that stocking rate then it can go up because just like us at lunch, if we'd had a buffet there and they turn all of us loose, we all get very competitive. And we'll, we'll try everything. But you know if there are just three of us in there, 
we can pretty well select what we want because we have no competition. And that's how grazing management is. It, it's the fear that they're going to get it and I'm not. And so now our stocking rates are about, oh, maybe 25 to 35% higher than it used to be in a good system. But that doesn't happen overnight. And it's all about organic matter and managing your soil. It's taken me about eight years to get there. And so I've increased my organic matter by almost a percent across all my fields. And that's really in helping in water infiltration and activity in the soil. Go ahead. Yeah. Right, let, me, let me hand you the mic. Okay. Jimmy, I'm, I, I grew up in Cerro, Oklahoma. I'm not familiar where Leedy is at. Oh, north of Elk City. Okay, so one of the things that you're very well aware of is wind erosion. Has your uh, process of doing this, has that helped alleviate some of the wind erosion? It alleviates it all because if you keep armor on the ground, then it can't blow. Right. Only in a I'm talking about wind erosion. We had a, a big wildfire. Uh, a year and a half ago, it burned half our county, 438,000 acres. It was the first time in eight years I've had land blow. I actually had wheat fields that were green that had so much residue that it burned the green wheat, and then we blew for a few days. But if you keep it covered, and that's the key to armor. Armor is more than just wind erosion. It's if you pour a cup of water on this surface right here, where's it going to go? If you pour it on this carpet, where is it going to go? Down. It's the same way. It, it, it's, it's a pretty simple concept. For Jimmy, uh, you had mentioned that um, once upon a time you were just growing a couple of crops, and I assume it was probably corn and beans or something along those lines. Okay, and wheat. Uh, so the guys around us are, are doing that as well. And, and want to try these different things, want to grow 15 different crops or whatever, the problem is, is there's nowhere to sell it. So did you run into that, and, and how have you overcome that? Ben, that's a good question. Thank you. So, yeah, marketing. And we had that conversation at lunch today. You know, you've got to be very creative when you get into marketing. And you've got to find out what's, what people want and then grow it. Used to, we took all our grain to the local elevator, and we took whatever the price was. And we hold it, try to get higher, but we still, in the end, took what they wanted to give us. What I've been able to do is cover cropping has went, it's been on the last 10 years on about a 20 to 25 uh, percent gain per year nationwide. What does that do? That opens up a seed market for seeds. So now I'm growing cow peas, mung beans, uh, uh, grazing sorghum, uh, let's see, sesame. Uh, I grow beans. I grow some double crop corn behind rye, which everybody says you can't do. But you can if you get your soil right. So you've got to go out and, and look for them markets. You know, I was in, in uh, Kismet, Kansas, which is north of Liberal, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, I, I'm in the middle of nowhere. They, they, they don't know. It's 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 nowhere. <clears throat> and we're sitting there in this field with the farmer, and we're digging in his soil, and we're having the same conversation. Like, well, I could, I could, I'd do that here, but there's no market. And right behind me is the world's largest dairy going in. The world's largest dairy. And I looked at him. I said, What about right here? He said, what's well, this dairy? I said, they need alfalfa, they need cottonseed, they can use canola. And I started down the list, and before long, you just got to look and, and be creative. And we do have trucks, and, and, and backhauling is pretty good. It's, it's hard, though. You, you just got to change that mentality. Uh, uh, way back. Uh, someone, there was someone over here. Let me, and I'll catch the, catch the one in the back. So also, also for Jimmy, so you're, you're doing what is outside the norm. And uh, I'm just curious, 
how it is that you are able to um, work with your neighbors so that they don't even if they think you're strange basically they say look he's doing a better job than I am his soils healthier than mine he's making more money so I think I might change so the question is how do you get what is now our dominant norm to change to do what you're doing <laughs> so I learned years ago landlords and neighbors are, are pretty well the same you cannot tell them what to do you, you got to show by example and and everybody wants to learn but they just don't want to learn from you and, and I've actually found neighbors in my fields and when I come over the hill they literally almost run to the pickup <laughs> Uh, we have field days, but in regenerative ag, all of us that speak in the circuit, the neighbors are the hardest. I, I'm very blessed that my 75-year-old father-in-law started after I did. He's, he's 70, well, he's fixing to turn 80 now. And I've got three neighbors, and, and then I've got some young guys that's, that's trying to embrace that, and they're trying to learn. That is very hard, and I do not go to the coffee shop. I, I just I, I just don't because we get in these debates that you can't win and I, I'm just not going to place myself because if I want to get down I can just look at the news uh, you know and I like to stay very positive and energized as you can tell about this but last year we were cleaning cow peas and harvesting we, we were harvesting in the fall normally about five or six things uh, and so it's a very busy time. We were trying to clean seed and ship seed at the same time. And so I went to the coffee shop to get burgers for the crew that was there that day, and I got trapped. It was like, what, well, Jimmy, what are you doing today? And I said, well, we're harvesting beans, and we're cleaning cow peas. What are you going to do with them cow peas? And then once again, it's back to marketing. And I said, well, I'm selling them for cover crop. Well, where's your market? Well, it's in Nebraska. Well, are you going to make any money with that? And it just hit me wrong, and this is the reason I don't go to this coffee shop. <laughs> and I said, I've generated about $380,000 this summer in these, in these crops. What have you done? And, and, and he was, a, he was a, a very clean farmer, and so he'd been plowing all summer and spending money, and they were griping about budgets and cash flow. And I, I, I regretted saying it as soon as I said it, but it's really the truth. And, and that guy is trying something now. We've got a question in the back. we got a couple of them. Let me get the woman in the back, and then we'll get you two guys. Well, I want to actually ask a question to the whole panel. Um, so I work in New York State. I provide farmer training to veterans through my nonprofit. And I keep getting approached by different organizations that are trying to sway me into um, getting veterans involved in hydroponic um, operations because the argument is always that it's very uh, profitable and a very good means of veteran entrepreneurship. But my organization is very much about soil. So what would, how would you respond if you were um, approached by an organization that was pushing for veteran entrepreneurship in hydroponic, uh, say containers or whatever the case, especially in inner cities, that's been becoming a big conversation. And I wanna make sure that uh, I present the right response. Um, I, I just had a fantastic conversation. There's a lot of a, a wealth of knowledge in, in this organization for the hydroponics. One gentleman, his name is Endeavor Shin. He's doing a business uh, speak thing tomorrow. He's doing something today. I caught him for about 20 minutes today, and it was just like, <sighs> but he is, uh, he, he, he runs a uh, uh, hydroponic uh, orchid business. It's international out of the West Coast. So he's a, a fantastic resource. Another gentleman who's not here that typically comes from Arizona is a gentleman named Kevin Fort, who knows all the, also knows all the ins and outs of not only hydroponic, but the aquaponic, which is fantastic food growth solutions for the inner cities because it's all self-contained, as you know. 
You know, it's funny whenever people approach veteran organizations, I guess it's tough to pick who to work with. So like for us uh, in Maryland, um, where we have one of our facilities, they had a, they're legalizing marijuana growing for medicinal use. And so everybody was putting together their packet to be a marijuana grower. And everybody wanted to somehow work us into their packet as if that would somehow help them with getting approval. Uh, so I said, that's great. Good luck with your packet. Call us when you got the permit. We'll talk about how we can work together, but keep my name out of it. And so, you know, I don't like to get used as much as the next person. So I think it depends on the motivation. In the case of some of the hydroponic operations in New York City, a lot of them right now are moving to the Baltimore, D.C. market. And so they're approaching us about processing their waste. And they're all backed by Google and all Silicon Valley money. So at the same time, if you can take their money, take it. It's all that stupid Silicon Valley money. <laughs> so yeah, I think for us, it's just a case-by-case -case basis. And I mean, go with your gut. There's plenty more people that want to help veterans. So if it feels disingenuous, then just tell them politely, no thanks is what I would say. It ain't worth giving up your morals. Yeah. Yeah, two more back here. I'll get him and I'll, I'll jump to you. I was just wondering for Jimmy, are you, uh, two things, I guess, are you irrigated or dry land? And then number two, are you, for your cover crops, are you doing a multi-species plantings or are you just doing a straight, particular specific cover crop every time so you can plant right into it or, or what are you doing there? That's a great question, Lawrence, thanks. Yeah, very, very good question. So I have two, two pivots uh, along the South Canadian River, so about 240 or 50 acres all out of the 2,000. Everything else is dry land. So multiple species in the summertime, because as soon as we harvest small grains, then I'll plant that, and then I'll graze them mixes before I go back into to fall. In the fall, it's very hard to do multiple species because different things. If you're farming row crops and cotton, if you're going to use defoliants, you're going to kill your broadleaves and your brassicas. So that's out. If, if you're using defoliants, Mother Nature will take them out if you, if you can't get them planted early. So we use a lot of cereal rye. We'll use hairy vetch and stuff, red clovers, if we got time to get them established in the window before Mother Nature freezes us up. So multiple species in the, in the summertime and as many as I can in the winter, but normally that's limited to two, three, or four, kind of depends. A lot of times we'll mix cereal grains like barley and oats and wheat and triticale and rye, but still in the cereal family. You have a question? Oh, let me get this gentleman over here. Um, so I have a question uh, in regards to the composting. Uh, have any of you either ever tried uh, mixing um, like mycelium? Uh, so for example, uh, I have an oy uh, oyster mushroom farm um, and one of our guys is looking to get into composting at an industrial level. Um, so pairing the two and putting the uh, spent uh, mycelium blocks into the compost. Have you tried or seen any success with that? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, we're pro mycelium, I think, here. It's not, not a bold stance to take. But um, I would say, like, the biggest thing we see so I live just below. Uh, if you ever go to Chester County, Pennsylvania, Kenneth Square is the mushroom capital of the world where they're growing more button mushrooms than anywhere else in the country. Then they have realized that the markets are changing, not everybody wants white button mushrooms. So now they do a lot of shiitake and they grow them at a very large scale on logs. And then they have all these logs come out of the mushroom houses. And so what their solution was is they're pretty spongy, but they're hard to compost, so they run them over with a bucket loader on a big concrete pad outside the, the mushroom house, and then that creates the surface area. So on your, your blocks, what I would suggest is breaking those blocks up to create more surface area and mixing it in. Uh, understand that you know the, the thing to tinker with there that might be interesting is if it's pretty sterile other than the mycelium inoculant, you might be able to introduce that to the compost process at a later stage because obviously in the early part of composting, that high heat, that's a bacterial function, and that may 
I don't know if, how much damage that would do to the mycelium. They may power right through and pop out the other side, or maybe that's something you could introduce in your curing phase after your compost pile cools down, maybe introduce that, because obviously they're going to love the carbonous material that remains. So it is kind of interesting. We do see a lot of fungal type activity in our curing piles at our compost facility and try to encourage that. But you know, usually uh, bacteria is much like uh, kids. They get after the sugary stuff first. So that's what makes your compost hot and then the woody stuff later. So that might be something. Definitely break it up and then maybe think about where to, to put it into the process so that you don't lose the value of that, of that mycelium. I'll, I'll get him and I'll get you, okay? It's for Jimmy. Uh, how, what do you say to somebody who's in a, a sandy loam soil type where their weather never freezes, it never frosts, and their soil temperature never gets below 55, so your soils never go dormant, and you've got you know, a growing season year-round, dry land farmer, uh, um, yeah, how do, you, how do you respond to that? So you just described my, my operation. We're, we're sandy loam. Uh, the, the challenge in a, in a growing season that doesn't go dormant is growing that organic matter because you actually get so much activity in, in the soil that they're consuming is faster, faster than you can grow it. I used to worry about getting rid of it, and now I can't grow it fast enough. And the key is just getting everything to start cycling and plant. Even in a limited rainfall, that my biggest hurdle early on was like, I can barely grow one crop. You know, how can I grow continuously? But when you get your soil alive, then that's a lot easier. Now, there are extremes, droughts and stuff that, you know, if it doesn't rain, it doesn't matter. So that, that is a challenge. And the sandy loams is, is a challenge uh, in year round that doesn't go dormant. I'm passing the microphone for Larry. He had to go to the private room. So. Well, I thought you were going to answer that question. No, uh, that was a good answer, though. But uh, there we go. Actually, this question is for you. Oh. Um, this one's for David. Now, the back to feed, is that in lieu of fertilizer, or once you treat the soil, how does that work? And I actually have another question too. Um, the the is there a good cover crop for like for weed control? I'll go first. Uh, basically, what we recommend with the back to feed is that you run us as a test first. So we don't we're not a fertilizer. We will enhance the ability and availability of your uh, fertility program, and but we want you to make your decision on on how much you cut back when we first run on a good test control you only have one variable and that would be the, the back to feed so for example we've got some guys run used to run 150 pounds of in on corn they're now running about 75 pounds of in on corn by weaning it down a little bit because they're always scared i do too much i'm gonna, and I'm just going to come back and bite me i still think they could go down below 75 but they're just they just get the heebie-jeebies when they get, <laughs> it's just like oh man this is going to get me i'm already kind of like cut my cost in half so it, we let the, it, if that answers your question, basically keep your fertility the first couple of times you use it's the same and then, and then you make the call as to whether you want to continue on because what will often happen if you keep 150 pounds of in on that corn, you end up with a, a steroidal harvest. And, some, and at some points the, the agronomist will say it might get too hot because we're, get, we're getting all that in available to that plant. And I'll give us the, for the other part of that. So yeah, the best way to control weeds is with a cover. So cereal rye works very good uh, for uh, helping with uh, pigweeds, Palmer. If weed can't grow with, with no sunlight. So if you keep it covered and you only open up a small window and drop a seed in, then, then you can control them weeds. I haven't used herbicides in quite some time. Back to the fertilizer. Uh, so it, on my corn this time, I put some nitrogen on. I won't put nitrogen on without uh, a carbon source, either a humic acid with that, because nitrogen is very hard on the biology. And so that's the reason to, to put some on, 
biology because if you're killing it off. So if you'll put a carbon source with an end, then you limit the damage to the biology. And, and you, the biology is what creates the nutrients out of the minerals. That, that's what you got to remember is we, we, we skip that mentality that, that we've got to put it on. We never put it on before at, until after the war when we discovered fertilizer because we do have the ability to grow legumes and, and, and species that will help facilitate uh, uh, nutrient growth. So the greatest thing you can do though, the worst thing you can do is go cold turkey. It will not work. It will not work because your soil's dead. And just like he's saying is we've cut down and cut down and we're, you know, two-thirds to 50 percent of what we used to be and we're just continually going down but it's a slow process because you got to build your population and you got to learn how how to do the rotation and the covers to, for your different soils because every one of us in here can't do the same thing because we live in a different area in a different climate with different precipitation with different temperatures and so that affects everything so you have to Make it work on your farm and, and not do exactly what I do. But the same principles apply everywhere. These guys are making me work. Well, we get a, you got to work out that cake you had at lunch. Um, so my question, I, I, first of all, I've got a statement for Jimmy. Um, Kismet is not nowhere. It, nowhere is about five miles down the road on the left. Um, There's always that one guy, and I'm usually him. Um, it is. It, it, I love Horizon, so I love it down there. Anyway, so for David, my question is, I'm, I'm getting the biology thing. I get that whole process. I'm, I'm right there with you. I understand what you're talking about. What about other applications other than soil application? Um, specifically, activating or accelerating or activating the composting process. And personally, I use... Um, making my own fish emulsion is an excuse to spend my day out at the lake. Um, so can I make this work faster so my wife doesn't yell as much? <laughs> yes, and, and in fact, I didn't get a chance to go into that on my, my thing, but we have a, a composter in Tucson that's tripled the size of his facility because it used, to not, it used to take him about six to nine months to turn over a pile of compost and he was using about 30 percent organic dairy manure and then green waste from landscapers everybody else who brought it all in he would ship it break it all down but he tried a couple of different organic material properties he had not ever tried the uh, aerobic process that uh, justin's talking about um, but he had he had tried a bunch of different uh, uh, microbials to to break that break all that all that organic material down faster um, but he, he couldn't do that. With using our stuff, he was able to break that compost down into about an eight-week turn. And when he really needs to get stuff out, like it is, uh, Justin was saying at the beginning of a, before the planting season in Arizona, we have like three planting seasons in the January, and then again in March, and then again in September. And so when he needs to put the spurs to it to get turn that from an eight-week flip to a four-week flip, he, he, he'll spray us on his piles every day and he'll turn his piles about two or three times a week. And that keeps the piles cool, but also gets a lot more organic material into those piles. And uh, last year he was composter of the year by the U.S. Composting Council. So he's, and it's went from about 10 windrows on about seven acres, he's just got a 40-acre place, he's going to have 30 windrows. So he's, you know, the compost business is a good business to be in. <laughs> When it's sunny and everybody shows up to work and nothing breaks. <laughs> so, so, so we, we got a couple more minutes. I've got one question for everybody here. and Just everybody take like a short answer. I know that's hard. Uh, if there's one thing you want everyone in this room to walk away from and, not, and remember tomorrow morning, what would it be? Justin? We're going to pass it around. See, Jimmy got up and moved. I, I got stuck with the microphone. <laughs> you know, I think listening to Jimmy's story for me is really inspiring. I think that's kind of the, the point is that all this is is doable for everybody. Just like you said, everybody has different conditions on their farm uh, or their property. I mean, all these principles are certainly doable 
at some level, wherever you're at and whatever you're doing. And we've certainly seen it at our quick story about the farm space we rent in Virginia. Virginia is a great state to build a landfill and it's a terrible state to make compost in. We're not allowed to sell the compost we make at our farm in Virginia. And so uh, we are allowed to sell our worm casting. So we do a lot of worm compost in there. But the, our straight compost off our aerated system, we use it all on the farm. And so the organic matter count in the pasture land and the vegetable areas is, is like through the roof. And we took what was an old kind of horse farm, gentleman farm, hay farm type operation. And now it's a really productive um, vegetable farm in just a couple of years. And so all these things are doable. And uh, no matter where you are, you can do it on your property with whatever the resources you got. So if you think you're going to be successful or you think you're going to fail, you're going to be right. Remember that? So the people that, I, that I've helped over the years that have been successful are the ones that, and you all have that mentality, being veterans, I want to say that, and I appreciate your service, is I ask someone that they come for me for help, I say, are you going to make it work or are you just trying this to see if it will work? That's the key. Making it work or seeing if it will work is two different things because the guys that just going to see if it will work, if they have any hiccup, any hiccup the first year, they're done. They're going to go back into the rut where they're comfortable. But if you're willing to make it work and try it again, even though if you have a hiccup or, or failure, I tell everybody, if you, if you fall moving forward, you're going to fall forward. And that's that's one thing I want you to remember. That's a tough one to follow, but um, my it's along the same way. Was the one thing that, uh, like Larry said, that you could leave this little seminar we had today with is there's a lot of great ways to amend your soil. The best way to not amend your soil is to do nothing. And so if you, like he just said, if you fall forward, at least you're still moving forward. So you will improve with any of these ideas that you've we've exposed you to today, you will improve the vitality and the productivity of your soil. I encourage you to try it because you will move forward, you will learn something, and most likely it'll be a profitable endeavor for you to expend the effort. So it'll be a great return on your time and your thought. Thank you. Okay, one more question because it's a beautiful young lady here. It's not a question. I'd like to make a comment. Um, as far as the aquaponics or hydroponics versus um, farming in the soil. I think there's a place for both, but I, when you're doing regenerating the soil, you're not just creating better soil for you, you're creating a better planet. And you're creating a better environment for our children to grow up in. And I think that it's a lot more than just being able to grow more or make more money. It's a really important thing to be doing for this earth and for generations to come. Okay. So, what is your name? Is that? Uh, I'm with a, a not-for-profit. Ellen. Ellen. I think on Ellen's uh, note, that's a good note to end on. I'm going to just share a short clip with you guys that I that I that surprised me. A grower in Nebraska, nine nine thousand acres. It's getting better yields than all the conventional guys and all the guy, all the guys around him. He was working with a, a composting company, who was l really looking at the soil nutrient ratios and how to get those, how to really dial those in. Spending less money, he was getting better yields than everybody else around him. Certified organic. He said, I don't need that organic certification to sell my stuff. I can, I can make a good living selling on a regular market because my costs are so low. I thought that was really interesting because his yields were better than everybody else's by getting the soil just right. So on Ellen's point, what's our mission? What's our mission? Great healthy soils. So let's go out and do it. Thank you, guys. Let's give a big hand for our panel. <laughs>